So now, um, for our first talk this afternoon, um, I want to give the word to Joe Grant, who is going to talk about um, hardware reverse engineering. Please give him a round of applause. Cool, thank you. All right. We might have to do a little sound adjustment, because is this really loud for you? Yeah. People's ears are bleeding already? OK. Is that OK? Does that sound good to you? OK, it's really loud. Cool. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming. My name is Joe Grand, and we're going to talk about some uh, superpowers for hardware reverse engineering. Thank you for coming after lunch. Most of you guys are probably just want to sit in the comfortable chairs and fall asleep, and that's OK. I won't be insulted. Uh, but yeah, thanks for coming. So this talk is uh, um, basically about using some kind of interesting technologies that we don't normally think about using for um, the security community, for in the security industry, in the engineering world. Uh, they're just sort of some interesting types of stuff. Um, also, just so you guys know, I'm, I'm an electronics guy. I'm a hardware hacker. I've been just, I live and breathe electronics. That's what I do. Uh, this particular research came out of um, some work I was doing for a cyber fast track project in the US, which was uh, a, a program put together by another hacker named Mudge, who was part of a hacker group that I was involved in as a kid called The Loft. And he ended up going to the dark side of the government to set up, basically hack the government and set up a program where they would fund small companies and hackers to do cool security research. Um, so a bunch of us you know, got paid to do what we were going to do anyway, uh, which is sort of cool. So this work came out of that. That particular work uh, I released at DEF CON, and that was called uh, a bunch of stuff about PCB deconstruction. So, so physically delayering circuit boards to get access to circuit board images, um, which I'll show you kind of the, the circuit board construction. But this talk is sort of pieces of that, some of the, some of the same, but a lot of the techniques that I tried that didn't necessarily work for the circuit board reverse engineering that would be good for higher level hardware reverse engineering and things that um, might help us. But it's mostly just to get you guys thinking about like, oh, you can use, you know, instead of just the, the standard soldering iron, oscilloscope, multimeter type of stuff, bus pirate, you know, it's like that you can actually so to do some really awesome stuff with electronics. So a little background of hardware reverse engineering first. Um, reverse engineering in general, as you probably know, is just the art of undesigning an existing system, whether it's a, a software application or network protocol or whatever. We're basically trying to break it down, figure out what the designer was thinking, uh, and interpret the data. So in our case, we're doing the same sort of thing. Uh, but from a hardware point of view, we might want to do it to figure out how a piece of electronics work. We might want to figure out where there is potential attack uh, vectors for maybe attaching a J JTAG interface or maybe there's a UART interface somewhere so we do some reverse engineering to figure that out that we can then use to further our attack. Um, maybe it's to see if somebody has, has manipulated the hardware to inject additional functionality into it, maybe tampering and, and kind of uh, adding additional hardware to it, or maybe you want to look at the hardware and figure out the best place where you can inject stuff. And um, the NSA has been very good at that, and probably other go government organizations as well. Maybe they use some of these same techniques to figure out, you know, where they can surreptitiously hide stuff in hardware. So we do that by, by looking at the product internals, looking at the circuitry, looking how things are connected, uh, looking at individual circuit board layers. If we get to that low level, if we recreate um, all of the different layers of circuit board, we're able to analyze those and actually get it back to an electrical schematic, which is sort of a graphical representation of what's going on in the system. So there's just lots of stuff you could do at sort of this board level state. Like there's been a lot of work of hardware hacking at a higher level state of kind of hacking Linux boxes and taking advantage of poor network um, uh, implementations and you know misconfigured Linux boxes on routers and all of this stuff and loading new firmware. Very high level and then you have very low level with guys like Chris Tarnovsky and Carson Knoll doing kind of chip level silicon die hacking but nothing really in the middle and that's you know the stuff that I love doing. So just a few slides on, on, the, uh, on the, the layer stack of how circuit boards are actually constructed. I like to call it a circuit board sandwich and even had my friend design an awesome circuit board sandwich shirt because I love circuit boards so much. And it's basically a sandwich of conductive and non-conductive uh, material, sort of la a, a layer. Um, does anybody recognize this uh, awesome dessert over here? 
Somebody's nodding. What, what is it? Can't remember the name, so you don't actually know what it is. Right? Who's from the Netherlands? Yeah, okay, so she knows, yeah. Okay, so it's a, it's a speckok, right? It's a in, D- Dutch-Indonesian layer cake. Um, and I, I was in the Netherlands and saw this and could not believe how awesome it, it tasted, but also how much it looked like a circuit board. Uh, and that's what the layers. You have your, your green, basically, or, you know, kind of fiberglass, epoxy, weave, insulating layers, and then you have your brown or copper conductive layers, uh, which is pretty cool. So, yeah, that's, um, that's what a circuit board looks like. Tastes a lot better than a circuit board. Here's what a real circuit board looks like. That's a cross-section of a 16-layer board. So there's 16 layers, alternating layers. And, uh, you know, a bunch of them are pretty thin. This is looking at a side, you know, cross-section view. A bunch of different layers, and then there's some thicker layers in the middle. So if you were analyzing a board like that, you'd say, okay, those thicker layers are probably a power plane or a ground plane or something. So even just from a very basic cross-section view, you can already start to get information and gather some clues about what the board is. And that's what hardware reverse engineering is all about. It's gathering clues, it's looking at different pieces of the product and trying to basically get as much information as you can and maybe some of it will be relevant, maybe some of it won't, but you just want to get as much as you can out of it. Uh, Other than the copper and insulating material, the copper and the substrate, you have some other stuff as well on a circuit board that could be useful for reverse engineering. Uh, The first layer, the top layer, is actually called the silk screen or component legend. That's all of the white markings on a board, sometimes they're other colors, but basically information that engineers want to put there to make their job easier, make make their development easier. Uh, For manufacturing, you'll put part designators so you can uniquely identify every part on the board. Sometimes you'll see even uh, connectors. If there was like a debug connector, you might even see, it would say debug connector or serial port or, you know, connect here or whatever. company information, manufacturer logos, all sorts of stuff. Because engineers like to put as much stuff on the board as they can because then it's less external documentation they have to research. If it's all on the board, they don't have to refer to anything else. So we can take advantage of all that. That's the top layer. Next layer down is solder mask, which is uh, a coating that's basically there to protect all of the copper on the board except for individual copper areas that need to be exposed. So things like test points or solder connections or pads for components. Most of the time, most circuit boards are gonna have solder mask over most of the board. So all this green area, even though you can see the traces through there, those are actually covered by solder mask. So if you wanted to tap onto one of those lines to monitor it or to cut it to, you know, do some sort of man in the middle or monitor monitor it and monitor it and then modify it, you'd need to scrape off the solder mask and then solder solder stuff to it. So it is a very thin layer. Um, so as you'll see in some of some of the technologies that we're using, we might need to get through solder mask, and there's a few different ways to do that. Uh, And then you have your copper and substrate, different types of substrate material. For this talk, it doesn't really matter, but basically um, we're using fiberglass epoxy weave is the most standard, but for some some more integrated devices and higher end devices, you'll see some specialized composites. Uh, So getting into technologies, we're gonna look at laser, sound waves, um, and X-ray. And I didn't mention, so those are actual, actually all superpowers from superheroes. I had a little link to Wikipedia at the beginning. Um, so these are real superpowers. And uh, I thought it would be cool to, you know, use these and see what we could do for, for reverse engineering. So lasers are cool, so I put those first. Uh, and lasers are now, you know, laser, um, laser engraving machines and all that stuff are, are pretty, easy, pr- pretty well available in hacker spaces and universities and things like that. This particular one that I'm using is slightly larger than most because it's just designed for larger area. Uh, but basically, this is a, a UV-based system, an ultraviolet-based laser system. Uh, in this case, designed for cutting basically thin layers of material for uh, uh, part marking or cover lay material, so kind of overlay or, or flex circuits. But I went in there and said, can we use it to, you know, can we try to laser solder mask away? Can we try to laser layers of, of, uh, of circuit board away? Which I'll show you some of that. Um, and it turns out that it works pretty well. It's sort of an extreme case. Like I talk about solder mask, more, more techniques for solder mask removal in the DEF CON talk. Um, but with this particular technology, with laser, it's very, very, very accurate. So if you wanted to just remove a particular area of solder mask on a board, this is the way to do it. Um, which is very cool. I'll actually show you um, 
why it's so cool here. So the picture on the right, iPhone 4, has this connector, some weird connector. I haven't done much research into what it actually is, but it's normally covered by solder mask, at least on the boards that I received, uh, which I got on eBay, which were clear knockoffs of the actual iPhone board, but still an amazing, amazingly complex 10-layer circuit board with, uh, I think it was 0.75 millimeters thick. Uh, I'll show you some other pictures of it later, but just sort of high-end, state-of-the-art circuit board. But there was a solder mask covering this connector here. So say you thought that was a programming connector or some sort of debug connector or something like that, you might want to use a laser to either just blast away an entire square, or if you were a little more careful, you could set up your machine to you know, just individually uh, ablate the, uh, just, the, just the pads themselves. That way it'd be easy to solder something else on. So you know, laser is good for kind of very, very delicate type of work. This board on the left, this was a test board that I was using for some of my work. Just a standard, it was a six layer board. And uh, this one we had a single pass at medium power using that machine I showed you on the other slide. I don't know what medium power is. It was just halfway between low and high. Uh, so I don't have any numbers associated with it, but you could probably go to any, you know, any other laser place and say, give me one pass at medium power and you'll get the same result. I'm just kidding. You probably won't, but you'll have to experiment with it. The problem with using laser is different types of materials react differently to different types of lasers. So we were using a, an ultraviolet laser, and the solder mask, top solder mask, and the actual FR4, which is a, a type of fiberglass epoxy weave, which is one of the most standard, um, ablate quicker. So they get destroyed and get removed quicker than the copper. So if you do too many passes at whatever power, um, depending on the board, you'll eventually start exposing the layer beneath what you're actually trying to deal with. On the other hand, this might actually be a good thing because now you can see, oh, there's an additional you know, trace here, there's another trace here, but you can't see all of it because the copper from the top layer is still there. And if you're gonna try to remove the top layer copper, then you would blast away too much of the, of the layer below it. So it's sort of this, you know, it's not ideal for getting access to different layers, but it is good for very delicate removal of solder mask. I'll actually show you some more stuff we can do with lasers. Oh, right here. Um, controlled depth skiving is basically a technique where sort of like solder mask removal, very, it's good for very, very delicate situations, um, but not very good for my you know, other goal of, re of accessing full layers of circuit boards, um, but it's great for doing like seriously tiny uh, operations. And this particular company that I used for, for some of this work specializes in reworking uh, military electronics, where you might have like a 16 layer, 32 layer, 64 layer board that maybe costs $10,000 US per board to get made, uh, and, the, and the engineer made a mistake and they need to access layer 17 to cut a trace, or access layer 17 to like reroute something else. Um, and you could do that with lasers. They had, this is a half, half mil um, beam precision, so that's not half a millimeter, that's half of a thousandth of an inch. So um, I don't actually have the conversion here, but uh, 25 micron Mil hole diameter, I mean, you could do some amazing, amazingly tiny stuff. So it didn't quite work for what I was doing, but it worked for some other really neat things. So here's like cutting some flex material, little lines. Here's like this tiny little comb of some sort. And here's the machine that does it. What's funny about this company, I love, I love telling this story. <laughs> uh, you know, most companies you go to and, and if they offer a service, you say, I want to, you know, rent some service. This is actually how I did a lot of the research. So the, that laser company, this laser company, the x-rays that I'll, that I'll talk about, you go and you say, I'd like to rent a piece of equipment with an operator. What's it going to cost? You know, I want to mess with some circuit boards. And they'll say a few hundred dollars an hour or whatever it is. Um, this particular company was, was a little more hesitant to work with me because they had done a Google search and found my name and said, uh, uh, you've done some interesting stuff. You have an interesting history. Um, and they were a little bit paranoid about working with hackers, which I did not agree with. Um, but what was actually funny is their machines that they're using, this is like an off-the-shelf machine, this GSI Lum Luminonics laser driller, designed for drilling tiny little holes in, in, in circuit boards for, you know, high-end circuit boards. Uh, but just like we do as hackers, they actually hacked that machine and customized it to be a better machine for what they wanted to do. 
So they were sort of, you know, afraid of working with hackers, but they in reality were hackers themselves and just didn't want to admit it. So their particular machine was ultraviolet and CO2, so it could, it could have two different types of lasers for different types of uh, equipment and different types of materials. So we took advantage of both. The two things we looked at first were trying to expose the layers, because that was you know, my primary goal. And you'll see that it, it, it sort of works, but not quite for the full thing. Uh, so just like before, I had my, my test board and my iPhone board over here. We just used the UV laser. Actually, we used the, the, uh, the UV laser first to remove the copper, top copper layer. In this case, there was like a full copper plane on top of here. And then we used a CO2 laser to basically remove any substrate that wasn't blocked by copper. So in this image here, we cut this little hole where this via was. And a via is, is a connection between different layers on a board. So this one, we, there's a hole here, a via here from this pin. And now we could cut into the second layer of the board and actually see the trace go somewhere else. Uh, and this was the case where we were actually treating that board as a black box type of board. So if we were hacking something that we didn't know what it was, this would actually be possible. The thing is, if you look at the area, it's really tiny. What, so what's that, like a centimeter or something? Or less by much less than that? A very narrow area to work with. So like if you're, like that's why this is good for sort of op very like delicate surgical operations and mostly better if you know what you're already working with. Here's a picture of the iPhone board. You can sort of get a sense for how tiny these traces are. This is 0.1 inch by 0.07 inches. Sorry, I should have converted those to millimeters, but I didn't. Uh, they're very, very small. Small area, but very, very small. But again, like it's such a small area, if you're doing a black box attack, it doesn't really tell you that much, so it's not really that useful. This was a fun one. Um, same circuit board. Without looking at the top bullet, can anybody tell me what video game this is from? <laughs> no? Moon Patrol, do you guys remember Moon Patrol? No? I know it made, I know it made it to Europe. Uh, okay, so if you haven't played Moon Patrol, you should check it out on the emulator. Very, very cool, old school arcade game. Uh, as part of my test board that I put together, it was a six layer test board, and uh, I thought it'd be fun to sort of have some known image where I could compare my results to the image, uh, to this known image and see how well it worked. So this is actually a, an image from Moon Patrol that I grabbed from Wikipedia and I color separated it into six different layers, which was convenient. Actually five different layers and then the final um, copper fill in the background. So that way for each layer of the board, I had a different feature of the, uh, of the Moon Patrol image. Plus I also wanted to see like how, how cool it would look um, on the board. So in this case, I was like, well, can we remove full layers? And I already knew that it wasn't really going to be very practical, uh, but I wanted to see how, you know, how, well, how well we could do it. The problem is we couldn't do it in the black box scenario because of the problem I showed you in the other slide. Uh, so I gave the, the Gerber data, the PC board layout data, to the operator in advance. So he could load each layer in and then very carefully control the laser to the point where he could, you know, remove very, very specific things as we went down for each layer. So it ended up being a great example of just being able to visually see the six different layers of the board. But here's the, the first unmodified layer. You can kind of see copper there. So the first step, we just remove the solder mask, right? So very delicate. You can kind of see the, the bumps in the road there. Next step, we removed the solder mask for that part above it. Then we blasted through with the CO2 laser and left the little car in copper. Then went down and kept blasting the different features. And eventually we were running out of time because I was paying this out of pocket. I'd already, I was already way over budget for the project. Um, but I thought this technology was so cool that I said, okay, I'm gonna just pay myself uh, to see what happened. But we were running out of time. I didn't want to spend too much money. So I was like, turn up the power of the laser and just blast it. Um, and they did and like just blasted the crap out of it and uh, all the fiberglass came off. It turns out that this fiberglass for this particular board I had made by a, a vendor that I use a lot in China, and for some reason they chose this super thick, very difficult to work with substrate. It's almost like they wanted me to fail, uh, but I showed them. So uh, this one here, we kind of blasted it, but you can see there's a lot of black marking on there because we'd rushed through the process and generated so much heat uh, during the lasering that we were delaminating layers of board, so removing layers of copper from the substrate. But it was a good experiment just to kind of see what could be done. So that was laser. 
course, there's plenty of other things you can do with lasers that I don't talk about here, uh, like burn, burn other stuff, and I don't know, shoot things with lasers. Uh, the next thing is, is sound waves. So acoustic microscopy. This is basically a technique that I'd never heard of before uh, until I started doing research for this project and was like, well, what, you know, what other ways can I try to not to non-destructively image things uh, and analyze things? So laser is obviously very destructive. Um, a bunch of other techniques I did for, for the circuit board work, like you know, sandpaper and milling machines and other things, very destructive methods that you're not getting the, the, the circuit board back after you look at it. So I was like, what can I do for non-destructive? Uh, acoustic microscopy was one that basically it was developed to identify failures inside of electronic components, specifically capacitors, if there was some failures in the way that the capacitor was made, if there were air, air gaps or voids inside of the capacitor, this type of technology would detect that. And like, that's sort of cool. Like we wouldn't have mobile phones and lots of electronic devices work as well as they do for the most part. Um, if we didn't have a technology like this, but most people aren't like, I'm gonna use acoustic microscopy to look at my circuit board or whatever, like it's just not really done. Um, but I wanted to do it, and again, I had the budget to do it, and uh, I think it was like 200 or $300 an hour to go and have a guy use the machine and, and I could just brought whatever I wanted uh, for him to analyze. Um, so it was pretty cool. And the way the system works is, uh, as opposed to x-ray, which are using um, x-rays, through a board, which I'll talk about in the next section. This is using ultrasound, so high frequency sound waves through some sort of coupling medium to get down to the target. So in, in our case, we're using water. Sometimes you can use, uh, I believe, alcohol as well. Um, and you're sending various frequency ultrasound into the board, and there's two different methods of, of capturing. Either you capture what gets, what gets sent all the way through the board, so you're capturing from the underside, which is called a through scan, and then you also have a technique where you're capturing the reflections off of the top, which is called a reflection scan. Uh, so we tried both of those techniques at different, uh, different frequencies and stuff to see what was actually possible. Some examples here are, these are more practical things. This is like a, a, a chip mounted on a substrate inside of an actual, so this is the silicon die inside of an actual package. And these marks are sort of air gaps, meaning that there's not good, not good connection there. This is a, a cracked silicon die, where and a lot of these things I'll show you when, I, when we talk about x-ray can't be detected with an x-ray. So it is a, another good alternative technology for imaging. Here, of course, is my logo, because I try to fit that in wherever I can. Here's the machine. Here's the guy. You'll notice, too, a lot of the guys that r are running these machines all have square heads. I don't know if, like, if they're just all born that way or what. Uh, but this, this guy was running this machine. Um, in a very small office too. It's sort of like, you know, this type of equipment, I imagined it was gonna be in this amazing lab with, you know, people running around with lab coats and clipboards and stuff, but it was just this nondescript office in the, some, you know, Silicon Valley office park, bland buildings, but you walk in and it's just this tiny little room with this guy in it in this very, very, very expensive machine, uh, which is pretty neat. So here's where you put your target inside of the water there. And then here's his working view, and you can see kind of results of the scan and different other stuff there that he didn't really explain to me. It was a visual representation of the actual ultrasound signal. So here's what the system looks like. It just kind of scans back and forth, and then there you can see the actual working view. In this particular scan, uh, I used a circuit board of a product I developed called the Emic 2, which was a speed synthesizer board, but it's a very simple four-layer board, and I had the exact uh, specifications for that board because I designed it. I could have used my test board, but I wanted to do four layer because that's sort of the minimum um, that would you know, make it worthwhile to use this type of thing. Two layer, obviously, you could just look at the top and the bottom. You wouldn't need a machine like this. So four layer was sort of the, the most simple that we could try in this machine to see if it worked. Um, and it didn't really work. Here's the, here are the results. These things here are just some of, of a few of the different attempts we tried at different frequencies. So, and you know, through scan versus uh, reflection scan. It didn't work for a four layer board because the sound waves basically go in and bounce all over the place. Some of them get returned, some of them exit, and the receiver doesn't properly receive stuff. The, the operator basically told me that if you have a device that has multiple layers, then your image is basically gonna be the equivalent of like when you yell into a pillow, you sort of get like a muffled response. 
that's sort of what we're seeing here is like the sound waves yelling into a pillow and then we don't get much out. So for, for doing full layer imaging, not, not so good. For other stuff, good. And he actually knew that in advance. So he warned me of that before we even went in. So I had luckily brought a bunch of other stuff as well to see, okay, well, it doesn't work for that. What can it actually be good for? And it can be great for examining epoxy. Uh, a lot of times with, with products, not so much on, on high volume consumer stuff, but uh, you do see it a lot are anti-tamper mechanisms, which are physical security for electronic products. To basically detect if somebody has tampered with your product, to make it harder for somebody to tamper with the product. And a lot of times people use epoxy encapsulation. So basically glue, non-conductive glue, over specific components of the board, or maybe over the entire board to make it harder. Um, there are ways to defeat that and, and, and things that I'm not gonna talk about here. But the first thing you normally wanna do if you encounter an epoxy encapsulated part is figure out what's underneath, maybe figure out how you can target what's underneath, or if it's even worth targeting what's underneath. So we can use acoustic microscopy for that. This thing here is a little USB thumb drive that I had somebody given to me at some point, I don't remember where. And uh, I originally had brought it to get x-rayed. And the result is what you would kind of expect from an x-ray, grayscale kind of composite image. Um, but it doesn't look like there's much there. This chip here is actually an exposed chip on the other side of the board. So it wasn't covered by any epoxy. And the x-ray operator who saw this image said, oh, well, there must be nothing under that epoxy. But as a hacker, I'm like, that doesn't sound right. There must be something under the epoxy or why would they pay money to put the epoxy there in the first place? Usually epoxy is like a big red flag of somebody's trying to protect something important. Um, but it was interesting that, you know, that, that the operator's view was very focused on if x-ray result doesn't equal, you know, or x-ray result is the truth because, you know, she's trained on just using x-ray. Uh, so it was interesting to sort of see that, you know, kind of just fo very focused on that, which is obviously not the, not the way you want to think. So I brought this over to the acoustic microscopy place. I had a feeling it was some sort of, you know, memory because it was a flash drive. And this thing on the other side was just, the, was a flash controller chip. Um, so we put it in the machine. And sure enough, we got, a we got a result back. This thing here is the actual silicon die mounted on some little uh, uh, carrier board. You can actually see, not in this picture, but if you look closely, there's lots of little traces here because it's actually the die mounted directly onto this little carrier, which is then wire bonded down onto the board. Um, so yes, there is something under there, and we can see that with the acoustic microscopy. And then I verified by just taking a knife and completely destroying the board and you know scraping through it to, to make sure, yeah, there's actually a silicon die there. So you can look through epoxy with that. Because um, this system works best when it's just a one interface. So one thing between the target and the, uh, the transducer. Here's another product. This was a, uh, this was a pin pad. So you know where you enter your pin number for, for debit card transactions or credit card transactions or whatever. This particular board had a giant block of epoxy over a bunch of components. I'll show you a different view um, with x-ray. But this could be possibly useful. Like you don't see any components under here because it, you know, it's only good for that one, one, one layer of interface. Uh, but you do see some air gaps in there. And you can slightly see some part numbering, not in that picture, but on, on my screen you can if you zoom in. So maybe you can gather some clues about what's going on, which could be interesting. But in the case of like, say you wanted to know the best area to stick your screwdriver in to like start prying the epoxy off or something like that. If there were air gaps there, you could identify where the weakest areas are. And of course you could apply this to other types of um, products that you're looking at as well. Okay, so that's sound waves. Uh, and then x-ray, another non-destructive imaging, very, very cool stuff. Uh, and we'll look at two different types, standard 2D x-ray, like when you go to the doctor and they x-ray your you know, broken hand or whatever. Uh, and then we'll look at CAT scan. When you're in serious trouble, you go and get 3D x-ray. Uh, so I'll show you both of those. So 2D x-ray is, is typically used for, um, during the PC board manufacturing process for checking connectivity and proper soldering of certain types of parts. Most notably, ball grid array devices, which are uh, very integrated devices, the squares with no um, pins on the outside, but with balls of solder underneath the part. 
and each ball is an individual connection. So if you open up any, any sort of modern device these days, you'll see ball grid array devices where you can't individually probe the pins because they're all underneath the device and it makes it a lot harder to get to. So usually during manufacturing, you'll, you'll need to do x-ray of each product and make sure that the balls of solder, each individual ball, is properly soldered down and there's no short circuits or anything like that. That's just part of the process. So most contract manufacturers that deal with ball grid array, which are pretty much everyone, will have access to x-ray. And now we can all get access to x-ray by going to one of those places. It's also used after the fact. Like if, a, if they assemble a product and it doesn't work, they might go back and look at, look at the board to see if there's a solder joint somewhere or um, maybe some other noticeable failure somewhere. Uh, just like a through scan of acoustic microscopy, we're basically just sending x-rays straight through the board and then capturing it um, on, the, on the receiver on this side. So here's the view of the composite. In this case, I had my logo on both sides of the board, so we see both sides of the board. This only is good for certain things, as you'll see. Here's the machine we used, Norts and Dage. Plenty of other brands as well. Um, but it's funny because I, I just I didn't think that it was that easy to get access to this equipment. And these are sort of high, you know, kind of high tech, multi hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of equipment. Uh, inside of the x-ray here is like a little chamber. You can put your, your pieces that you want to x-ray there and then adjust the, um, adjust the beam strength, adjust the angle, adjust contrast, and do all of these things in real time, which is cool. As opposed to like back in the day when you would get an x-ray, right, you'd have to wait for the film to get developed or you'd see something but you can actually manipulate this stuff in real time. So if you're looking at something, it's like, oh, can we tilt that board a little bit and try to get a better view? Can we adjust this? Can we zoom in, zoom out? You can actually do that. And that's where things get, get actually useful for reverse engineering. So general board inspection is great. Um, you know, you get, get, some, get some ideas of how the board was fabricated, uh, maybe some internal traces. You're not gonna be able to fully you know, pull out everything, and I'll show you some other pictures, but you're not gonna be able to pull out every individual layer, but you'll be able to see where things go. And that might be enough in certain cases to actually continue with your attack. Here's an example. Uh, this is a Verifone pin pad, so another type of, of pin pad device. I picked pin pads for, for some of this work because those really are the most common to have some sort of anti-tamper feature in them, whether it's epoxy or, or some sort of active um, protection or something like that. So this one is a pin pad 1000 SE, still in, still in use. And when you open up the board, there's actually, there's a bunch of other anti-tamper stuff, but there's this board that connects over, that like plugs on top of one area of circuitry. And if you take this board off, there's a bunch of, really good stuff there, like the microcontroller and memory and, and some other things that you would probably want to use as part of your attack. There is also some conductive um, stripes here that connect down to 16 different pads on the board, which tells me right away that, okay, there's some sort of active mesh going on, there's some sort of circuitry in the board that's making connections between these various different pieces. Because this board itself is just copper on one side and then copper on the back side. So I said, all right, I want to look through it, but I don't want to destroy it. What can I do? Brought it to the x-ray place, and we looked at it, and sure enough, there's tons and tons of little traces. It looks like two, two, two layers, because it's just two layers inside, uh, of maze. So it's just all you know, right angle traces and stuff, and it's part of basically a maze where maybe this pad you know, goes all over the place and connects to a pad over there, and then this pad down here goes all over the place. So you have to have these connections, and I had actually found a, uh, a US patent application talking about anti-tamper protected enclosure, which is very similar to this design, and it, they explain that the traces have to be a particular length and they have a particular impedance, so an attacker can't you know, cut through it, blah, blah, blah. But now that we know how the system works, and we know what the system looks like, we can now devise an attack against it. So for simple boards, because you can operate the x-ray in real time and move things around, um, it is actually possible to follow particular traces. This might be good where, say you have a ball grid array part that you need to remove a, or, or cut a trace or find out where, where the JTAG port from the uh, microcontroller is on the chip and where it connects to on the board. So instead of removing the part from the board and following things out visually, you just x-ray the thing, find out where the pins go somewhere outside of the BGA part that you could then solder to, 
maybe you scrape off some solder mask and solder a wire to, or maybe it goes to a test point, and then we wire up our connector and do our attack. Um, this would be the first step, and we don't have to destroy anything in the process. So you can, for simple boards and for some things, figure out where a particular trace is, and for simple boards, maybe do a little more of actually getting, getting a better idea of what the board is. But here's just a simple example. This is a, this is a design of a laser rangefinder that I worked on. Very small, 20-pin ball grid array device. This is the actual circuit board design program, and then this is an x-ray from the real unit after it was manufactured. This is from the manufacturer who was testing, you know, testing the boards and, and verifying everything was okay. So this is looking through the board, but you can see, you know, say I want to target this particular trace because I look up the data sheet and I know that, oh, pin A5 is a pin that I want to start manipulating for something. So I could look on the x-ray and then, you know, trace that out, it comes out here, and then maybe I could follow that where it goes. I mean, this, this is a better example here comes out here, attaches to this gigantic via that I could then solder something onto or stick my multimeter probe or oscilloscope probe. So it is pretty cool. And all the, you know, all the traces line up as they should. Here's some other pretty pictures of, of x-rays. Uh, a little hard to see on here, but this, this image up here is another one of the, my four layer board. You can see very slightly one, two, three, four, there's four different layers, and I put a copper number on each layer, which is standard. A lot of circuit board designers do that, so you know which layer is which. And then as the board gets assembled, the fabricator knows which layer is which. Uh, so you can sort of see that on, on that board. So if you are interested in like a particular trace or something, you can kind of get a general sense of what's going on. Here's the iPhone board, where not much is really useful from that picture, other than it looks cool, but there's nothing from a hacking point of view that, that I think is really uh, practical. But it is assembled, and because we can see straight through the board, we're not really seeing a lot of the silicon dyes in x-ray, right? We see it in acoustic, but not in x-ray. We can actually see the board, and maybe, you know, maybe there is something hidden under a component or something that we would maybe see there. Here's some closer views, some really zoomed in views. Here is, this is a, these are, these are from my test board over here, so if we look at the upper right image, uh, if you squint, and if you're really far in the back of the room, you'll be able to see one, two, three, four, five, six, because these are layer numbers on that test board. And if it's angled, you can get a better view of it. Down here, these things are called layer stripes, and this is another way that, that designers, another feature designers build onto their board, so when the boards are fabricated, the, uh, the manufacturer knows to you know, start stacking small, long, 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 longer. And then if there's a problem with the board, you can look at the stacking stripes, and if they're out of order, you go, oh, the fabricator screwed up, you know, there's a problem with the board. If you don't know the layer count of the board, and you don't have a cross-section, and you don't want to, you know, make a cross-section, say you only have one board to work with, you can actually do an x-ray, and then angle the board slightly, and focus in on a hole, and you can count the number of layers on the actual board. So this is from the iPhone board, a tiny, tiny little hole that we zoomed in on. And it, you're not going to be able to see it on the projector, but there's 10 different layers. You can sort of see the top layer, one, two, three, the dark lines of the copper, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So they're all there. So you can get some general information. Here's some, some stuff about uh, epoxy. So x-ray is also good for, for examining epoxy, like acoustic microscopy. Uh, arguably better, but you don't see air gaps in this case and other things. So, you know, it's like any other tool. One tool is going to give you some information, another tool is going to give you another. Um, so with x-ray, in this case, though, with epoxy, we can look straight through the board, unless the epoxy has so, some sort of metal you know, mesh or some other protection there to prevent you from x-raying it, which generally is not the case. We can see straight through the board and identify um, components inside. This particular one is a great example of uh, security that worked. So 1982, you guys remember Pac-Man, right? Yeah, okay, so Pac-Man, yeah, so Pac-Man, um, very popular game, and uh, had a, you know, guy eating dots and ghosts and stuff. But what Bally Midway wanted to do with Pac-Man, because it was so popular, eventually it became not as popular, right? So they wanted to create some sort of upgrade where the arcade game operators, the people who had these arcade games, the pubs, uh, could upgrade the game but not have to upgrade the hardware. So Bally Midway came up with this idea of having this piece of circuitry that you would plug in place of the Z80 microcontroller on the Pac-Man board, and then a bunch of encoded ROMs that they would give to you as well. So if your friend just tried to copy the ROMs and put them in his Pac-Man game, you wouldn't have this upgraded version 
uh, which was Pac-Man Plus, which had different mazes and, and different characters and stuff. So you needed to have this big block of epoxy. So it was sort of like an early DRM type of attempt. That worked really well. Uh, you know, and it actually stood the test of time 18 years later um, when a guy named Clay Cowgill decided that he wanted to figure out how the encoding was done so he could play it on an emulator. He's a classic gaming enthusiast. Um, and this type of hardware hacking is actually very common in the, in the retro gaming kind of game emulation, uh, arcade game emulation world, because there are all these weird arcane kind of electronic designs that need to be figured out in order to preserve some of this digital history. So this one turns out, um, it was a solid block of epoxy, about half an inch thick, that uh, he said, okay, well, I'm gonna bring it to my friend who's a veterinarian and put it inside the pet x-ray, get a little image back, and right away you can sort of see some of, the, some of the stuff inside. So he knew this was a Z80 because that's, you know, plugs directly into the Z80. And then there was a bunch of other logic as well. And then through a whole other process, which he talks about down here, he basically, now he could focus his attack just on one area and basically cut away the Z80 that was there, solder in a bunch of wires to run to a Z80 emulator, and then now he had control, right? He was in control of the whole situation. He could say, give me data at address zero, and he'd get the data. Give me a data address one. Read out all of the data in the unencoded form, because it turns out that these devices here were actually, um, these were programmable logic devices, and this was uh, just a standard logic device. So the address and data lines were all being shifted and, and manipulated um, with these gates. So he just was able to dump out a, a straight unencoded version, and now we can all play Pac-Man Plus on emulators. And it all started with, you know, a single x-ray uh, from a pet x-ray machine. Here's a more recent view of a different one, another pin pad. And you can see giant block of epoxy. This is the same one that I looked at under the, uh, under the acoustic microscopy. It's a little dark on the slide, but underneath the epoxy, you can see one big chip, two big chips, another chip. And this thing here is a crystal oscillator, which normally is used to generate a very precise heartbeat uh, for a timing sensitive system. So either micro microcontroller, maybe a real time clock, uh, something like that. Something digital usually. But it's also kind of a giveaway that if you, see a micro if you see a crystal, it's probably next to a microcontroller. So that's probably, you know, maybe that's a clue that that's where we want to start our attack. So you can see this is probably memory. This is probably the microcontroller because there's the crystal. This is probably some sort of custom chip, or maybe that's where the, the crypto is happening or something like that. But you can start to take guesses once you can, you know, get a, get, a, get a view of what's going on. You at least can now start going down a path of attacking the product. So it's one step in the process. This is my favorite result of all time. Uh, and this overlaps with the, with the DEF CON work as well, because it was so cool that I couldn't, you know, leave it out of either one. Uh, so 3D X-ray where we're basically taking lots and lots of 2D x-rays at different angles around the target board, post-processing that with lots of math to get back a bunch of slices through the target object. So just like if you go online and do a search for a CT scan human brain, you'll see slices of a human brain. Uh, this particular technology, I also had no idea that it, it existed, but when I was leaving the contract manufacturer to, from the 2D x-ray, he had said, hey, you know what? Like, this sort of isn't working for you. Why don't you talk to my friend, who happened to be in the same office park, which was totally awesome. Why don't you talk to my friend, uh, who can do 3D x-ray? And I'm like, you can do 3D x-ray on circuit boards? He's like, yeah, they do it all the time. Um, which turns out they didn't actually do all the time. Uh, but it was great. I still got the contact information. So I end up calling the guy. And the owner of the company that I called was actually in Germany at the time. So, you know, nine hours later than, than where I was in California. So it was like three in the morning, his time. And I call him up and I hear the, the, the phone switch from the US ringtone to international ringtone. And I'm like, oh crap. Uh, but I didn't hang up. And sure enough, three in the morning, he answers the phone and he's like, hello. And I woke him up. Uh, and I sort of was like, oh, I explained the situation to him. I'm like, I'm a hacker. I have government funding to look at circuit boards. Uh, I'm interested in, you know, doing 3D scans. He's like, well, I, you know, never actually done that with circuit boards. Like, we tend to look at very small things like the inside of a, a solder ball, of one, one tiny solder ball on a chip or on a, on a part to see if it's been soldered properly. Or we look for cracks inside of the solder ball to see why that product failed. 
he's like, but I'd be happy to try it. You know, it's just a very, very, very cool thing. Even though I woke this guy up and he had no idea who I was, he's like, you know, I'm coming home in three days. Let's schedule it and let's do it. So I went over there and, and we brought some circuit boards and tested it out. And what was cool is that this, you know, this guy runs this company doing 3D imaging and had never done this particular attack before and like was really into it. So we were sort of going through it together, um, you know, seeing if it was going to work. Because he didn't think it would. He was, he was thinking, well, if there's multiple layers, the x-rays might blend together. You might, the images might not work. You might not get good resolution. Like he was very kind of hesitant, but he still wanted to see it. And I was like, well, it's okay. I'm going to pay you anyway, whether it works or not. So let's go ahead and try it. Uh, so yeah, so 3D X-ray normally is not used for looking at circuit boards, but sometimes it is. A government agency had contacted me after after uh, this work was released, and they're like, you know, we do very similar things for certain scenarios. So I was kind of pleased to hear that. Um, but most of the time, it's for looking at component packaging and solder ball quality, and you know, all the failure analysis stuff that we talked about for all the other technologies as well. Uh, so let's take a look. Here's the uh, here's the machine. Very similar to the other one that we used for 2D, but this had some extra software package, $250,000 US, I think, to do the slicing. And here's the working view in that case of once you do all of the, your, your multiple images around the object, you do your post-processing, you can load it into a 3D manipulation tool uh, of, of lots of different types. This particular one is called VG Studio. There's also some open source tool set, I can't remember what it's called, um, that a lot of hospitals use. That's an open source 3D manipulation tool set, and you can write special plugins to analyze data and things, which could potentially be, be pretty cool. Uh, but this shows the X, Y, and Z views, and then the, the kind of total 3D view of that particular. These are, these are slices through, and then this is the, the full view. So you can then start manipulating all the data inside of that tool. So we did that with that four layer circuit board, the Emic 2 circuit board, took 360, 2D images around, around the object at a 50 degree angle. I'll show you on the next slide how it actually does that, which is one image every six seconds. This whole process took about 30 minutes. Uh, imported all of the, the, the post-process data into this 3D manipulation tool, and then we could basically take like a scroll uh, uh, bar, or whatever it's called on the side, like the menu bar, um, and manually just kind of move through all the different slices in the Z plane through the board. And we couldn't believe it, that you could actually see different layers. And I'll show you that as well. Uh, in a case where you don't know the layer count and you don't know things about the board, this is a great process because you can do that. And then you can measure the interlayer spacing between layers. And now you have another non-destructive way to determine uh, layer count. But very, it was very, very cool. And I'll show you the results of that. And this is where the guy was like, well, you know, if you have too many layers, it might not work. If you have different layer thicknesses, maybe your copper thickness, maybe different substrates. But in general, this is just an awesome, awesome, non-destructive uh, way to extract layers of a circuit board. So here is the, the top view here. You can see this is sped up, but it's basically, you know, taking pictures around the object. And then down here, you see the view very slightly shift every time it's taking a picture. And then down here, we have this little solder ball that we use as a fiducial marker that we put in one spot on the board. So then when all these images are taken, the system knows that it uses that fiducial as a reference marker as it then goes and reconstructs all of the, all of the data. So that's the, the view of the scanning in action. Once we did all the scans, we post-processed it and everything and you know, saw that it worked, we made a little video to actually go through and, uh, and show each layer. So here's looking at the board from the top layer, and we're slowly scanning down through the, through the board. We'll eventually see, it comes up really fast. So we're eventually gonna get into focus, and we'll see the top layer, which is there. Second layer is there. And then we go through the board. So now we're going through the substrate, so you see some of the via holes still. Then you get to the third layer, which is there, and then the fourth layer is there. So it's a, little, it's a little fast, but of course, you know, I have individual JPEGs of each layer that now I can, you know, use and reconstruct and uh, start figuring out how things connect. And just to prove to you that it actually works, these are the Gerber plots from the actual four layers of the board, and then these are the results from the CAT scan, and, and they match. 
Um, so pretty cool. You might notice that this is just a small area. So this is much larger than the area that we use for our la laser manipulation and stuff. But it's still like maybe two inches by one inch. So if you had a larger board, you'd have to do multiple scans across the board and stitch them together. But still totally possible and very, very cool. Um, OK, so that's all I have for, for this presentation for laser and sound wave and uh, um, x-ray. Um, lots of other techniques, tons of other things that I have in mind to do with, with hardware hacking and with circuit boards. Um, but that's it for now, and thanks for sitting through it. And do you guys have any questions? I think we have a game show host that's going to run around with a microphone to ask questions. Yes. Oh, there's a few. Cool. And all this information is, on, is already released on my website. So if you go to grandideastudio.com, you can grab it. You mentioned you didn't know exactly what the power um, rating was on the on the medium setting on the lasers. Do you know what the actual power rating of the lasers, um, like the maximum power rating of those lasers, w uh, was that you were using? Um, I don't, but I could find out because that was the it was a certain brand of machine. So it was like a T Tech, right. whatever laser. So I didn't I didn't actually look it up, but yeah, maybe medium is like half of the maximum or something like that. Right, and you were just basically just sort of scrubbing back and forth over the area until it. Yeah, we basically just, just, just went in a square. So we, we were actually doing s multiple runs at that medium power, but the best result was when we just did it once. And then we were like, well, what happens if we do more? And then it just basically fucked up the board after that. So those machines have to be pretty accurate to not, not go over the same area twice as they scrub back and forth, yeah? Yes, yeah. Right. And the, so yeah, I guess you, sort, you also have to take the beam width into account, which yeah. is really small, but the system, it, the, the the control software usually does that. So if you say, I want to ablate this square, it will adjust itself as it needs to to make sure there's no overlap. Cool. Thanks. Yep. There's another question down here. <laughs> We're having a moment. Was I too close to you? You can shout. Okay, I'll repeat it. Yeah, so, in, uh, so the question was, with all these different techniques, like do I give any sort of estimates or, or characterizations, I guess, of you know, how good will a particular technique be for, or how, like, how good a technique would be against a, me a protection measure or something like epoxy or whatever. Um, I, sort of do it in, I sort of do it opposite. So not, in, not with this presentation, but in the DEF CON presentation, also at the same link for all this stuff. Um, I have a matrix of the different techniques of delayering the boards, and some of these are included, where it's you know how hard, how, the time it takes, the complexity, the likelihood of success, and all of this stuff. So it sort of characterizes the te technique. So if you're on the design side, you could look at that, and you know say, okay, well we know that if someone's going to use X-ray or try to do CAT scan, maybe we need to implement a thicker copper, or maybe we need to implement a, a better substrate. And then you could do experiments to see, you know what the limits are of current technologies to make it harder to reverse engineer. So you sort of have to use that and then kind of, you know, reverse that. Cool. Any other, other question? You just yell it out. Right. So if I tried to use these techniques to tamper the actual working, like an active operation against a device, um, no, but I feel like there was some research into using lasers on dyes on chips, so shining lasers down on certain spark parts to cause glitches, I think. Um, so I haven't done that personally. I believe there's a paper on it. Did you do that one? No, okay. Yeah, so there's some work done on that. So yeah, using lasers at a, at a chip level to like, you know, cause some sort of glitch or something. Uh, with sound waves, possibly could be done. X-ray, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, maybe X-ray in live operation as well. The sound with the acoustic microscopy would be hard because since you have to actually put it inside of alcohol or water, you might end up damaging the electronics in the process. But yeah, X-ray or laser, I could definitely see. But I haven't done that. But that that seems like a next logical step. Any other questions? Yep.
yeah, so with the Moon Patrol image, uh, the front layer wasn't damaged when we did the subsequent steps. And yeah, that was because I'd provided the Gerber information to the operator so he could now avoid that area and focus on the subsequent layers afterwards, yeah. So we were sort of cheating, right? And like, if, if you already have that information, it's not that great for black box reverse engineering, but it's still good for repairs of something you know, it's just not really that, that good. Yeah, right. With time, if it, yeah, it's a very time-intensive process. But you could. That's exactly right. You could, you could do a first pass, see what's exposed, then use that as sort of a mask to avoid doing that on the next time, and and go down that way. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Hey, up oh, another one. Um, are there measures to protect against three D X rays? Not that I know of. Not on a board level. Um, like I think the only things would be maybe to use substrate that maybe doesn't, or that absorbs maybe more X-ray, or copper that's thicker to make it harder to for X-rays to pass through or something. But there's no, as far as I know, uh, there's no kind of at least off the shelf commercially available knowledge about that. Uh, maybe in the government space they know stuff that we don't, um, but maybe I give them too much credit. Anything else? No. Oh, one more. Yes. Um, have I done inline sniffing on boards? Um, I personally have done sort of man in the middle type of stuff against certain certain si individual signals. Yeah, not as part of this work, but as general hardware hacking stuff, definitely. If you you know if you can cut a signal, monitor what's going, figure out what it is, and then you know change data on the fly. Not not very different than what you would do for a man in the middle on on network side. Yeah. Yes, and it's a good, good, very valid attack. Cool. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks again, everyone. And, and uh, Zaz and I will see you tonight for some after-dinner entertainment with Prototype This. <laughs>